Welcome to Emergency Medical Center webinar. I am Lynn Harmon, Program Coordinator, and today's topic is Breast Cancer Updates. Joining us is Dr. Vincent Reed, Medical Director of the Hall Perrine Cancer Center. I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar today, Dr. Reed. I'm going to hand the mic over to you now, and we will go ahead and get started. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. Um, as Lynn said, we're going to be talking about breast cancer today. Of course, as you know, this is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This is one of several educational activities we have planned here through the Olaparain Cancer Center uh, uh, with regards to uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, one in eight women in America will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Depending on what studies you look at, it will say one in seven to one in eight. Needless to say that this is a common problem uh, in the United States and in North America in general. Uh, there are several ways in which we can uh, discover breast cancer or that can imply that there is breast cancer, or a suspicious mass. Of course, there is the ever-existing self-breast exam, and women continue to be encouraged to examine their own breasts at regular frequency because, of course, any new lumps or bumps within the breast will likely uh, be discovered by their hands since they know the contour and topography of the own breast better than the physicians do. Of course, mammography remains one of the best screening tests for any kind of malignancy there is, and, and uh, mammography is recommended and continues to be recommended according to the recommended guidelines starting around uh, age 40. We have uh, several generations of mammography. Now there is the advent of uh, 3D mammography, and we will certainly see how that impacts uh, uh, the this age, this new age of breast cancer imaging. But certainly mammography continues to be recommended. Breast cancer is second only to lung cancer as a cause of cancer death in American women. Uh, like I said before, uh, one in seven American women will uh, de develop breast cancer during their lifetime. You know, we have evolved uh, significantly with regards to the treatment of breast cancer. The Dr. Halstead fathered the uh, traditional uh, radical mastectomy, and that is not an operation that is uh, uh, performed today. We certainly have had several iterations of the mastectomy. And later on in this talk, we'll get into uh, some of the treatment modalities with regards to surgery as far as breast cancer is concerned. Here we have a, a, a map of the incidence of breast cancer. You see, you can see that the incidence has risen and, and has at least remained uh, stable over the past several years, but this continued to be a significant uh, health problem in the United States, and this chart is from the uh, CIRA database. Just to give you some general uh, uh, landmarks for the breast, the breast is made up mostly of, of uh, ducts, lobules, and adipose tissue, as you can see here. Uh, the breast sits on the on the chest wall. The muscle behind the breast is the is the uh, pectoralis major muscle. It, again, it consists of a lot of uh, fat tissue, lobules, ducts, and lymph nodes, and and so that uh, you know you will see that the cancers tend to develop within these structures within the breast. Uh, in general, the ducts carry uh, milk uh, towards the the nipple. Uh, and the lobules, uh, and uh, they're all kind of linked by this uh, network uh, that you can see here. This, this is some of the same, just basically saying that these are the structures that are within the breast. Blood vessels, as we know, like other structures, carry uh, nutrients and nourishments uh, to the tissue. And of course, there are arteries and capillaries. Uh, the lymphatic system drains fluid uh, that usually carries white blood cells, and white blood cells, as we know, fight uh, disease, and they carry this fluid away from the breast tissue into the lymph nodes, usually under the armpit and, and uh, behind the breastbone. These would be the first stations to which the lymphatic uh, ducts within the breast drain. Uh, lymph nodes uh, filter harmful bacteria, and they play a key role in fighting off infection. Uh, and anything basically that's foreign, and that is why uh, cancers within the breast will travel to the lymph nodes usually as the first site of, of spread or of metastases. Uh, 
Again, this is a, a pictorial example of what we just talked about in terms of the functional uh, nature of all of these structures within the breast. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of breast cancer? Uh, well, we often talk of discharge or bleeding from the nipple. These are concerning things that have to be worked up. Any kind of change in the shape of your breast. If, if you uh, examine your breast frequently, and even if you can't tell that there's a mass there, but the entire contour of your breast seems to have been changed, that is something that warrants an evaluation. Most commonly, though, it's lumps and bumps or, or thickening of the breasts. And, and these are often painless, which tends to differentiate them from infectious processes. There are certain kinds of cancers as well that will present with the, the nipple being inverted. Now, some women have nipple inversion naturally, but if your nipple is not inverted and you notice that that starts to happen, that's something to be, to be worried about. While redness and, and uh, these kind of inflammatory changes tend to suggest infection, uh, certainly in the non-lactating women, for example, things that would uh, seem to be infection should also be investigated because these can also be potential warning signs of a developing uh, cancer. There are numerous uh, non-cancerous conditions in the breast, and since this is a talk about breast cancer, we've listed them here for completion, but we won't get into these uh, various uh, non-cancerous areas, but there can be a lot of things going on in the breast, and so the, the non-cancerous conditions are numerous. One of the things that, you know, we, what we hope is that we'll find most cancers at its early stage, and, and that is we'll find these things as abnormal calcifications in the breast. And calcifications are not that uncommon in the breast, but we have different kinds of calcifications. So there's a grading system that looks at calcifications and kind of determine whether the calcification is benign appearing, malignant appearing, or suspicious appearing. So hopefully, uh, the hope is that most of the cancers that we find, if you continue to undergo your surveillance at the appropriate uh, schedule, is that most of the cancers we find will present as a calcification rather than as last large masses within the breast. Again, this is another example of normal breast tissue. We'll keep going. The, the, the cancer you know, usually starts out within those structures of the breast that we talked about. Here is, is, is a, a cancer or the beginning of a cancer within the duct. This is a so-called stage zero cancer or pre-cancer or DCIS. All of these names would apply here, where the cancer really hasn't broken through the basement membrane of the cell, but certainly this is disordered and irregular uh, uh, area and, and would suggest that this is, uh, you know, just pictorial, that this is a, a cancer. And this would be, uh, like I said, pre-cancer or ductal carcinoma in situ. Now, cancer can arise a, in the ducts and in the lobules, as, as you will see. Once this cancer breaks through the basement membrane, it becomes an invasive cancer. And at, the, at this stage, it has the potential to spread the lymph nodes, lymph nodes within the axilla, lymph nodes under the muscle, and it also has the potential to spread to distant organs. And that is what determines really the stage of the cancer. What is the size of the cancer locally? Uh, are there lymph nodes present? And has this cancer spread to distant sites? So that there's a range of, uh, uh, of conditions that happen. It goes from, uh, the progression is from normal cells to usually to ductal hyperplasia to atypical ductal hyperplasia, and this, will, if not removed, will progress to ductal carcinoma in situ, which will progress to, frankly, invasive cancer. Like I said, uh, breast cancer is made up of most of ductal lobules, so the vast majority of cancer in the uh, breast are going to be the so-called invasive ductal cancer. However, about 25% of breast cancer will be of the lobular nature arising in the lobules of the breast, and, and that is invasive lobular cancer. Cancer can uh, invade lymphatic vessels or blood cells. Uh, usually when it invades lymphatic vessels, it deposits into the first echelon lymph nodes, which would be in the axilla. And certainly if it's uh, uh, hematogenous or blood cell spread, that can end up anywhere within the body. This would be a pictorial example of, of, of mammography. It, it, it doesn't look like much fun and probably is not, but uh, I like to call it a necessary evil. Um, and so most women uh, will be very, very familiar with this uh, kind of instrumentation. Uh, again, you know, what can you see with this kind of imaging? Well, you will certainly see masses here on your left. 
but you'll also see calcifications. And, and then, like I said before, those calcifications will be graded. Uh, so if you look at this mass here, the mass to the left is, uh, is irregular. It, it's speculated. Um, and this certainly has, from a radiologic standpoint, from an imaging standpoint, this certainly has, there's more suspicion that this lesion is, is, uh, is malignant versus the lesion on the left that seems very, very regular with, with, with mostly smooth edges, and it's probably a benign lesion. So let us talk about uh, a, a patient, for example. Let's talk about a 56-year-old woman with an abnormal area of calcification in the, most, in the upper outer quadrant of her breast that is found in mammogram. What would the next step be? Well, the next step would be some kind of biopsy. This is, this is, you, you, you get this biopsy, and this is a, one of the ways to biopsy. This is called what we call a stereotactic table, and this is basically biopsying with, uh, with mammogram aid. So then... If this is biopsied and this turns out to be a malignancy, then there will be the discussion of treatment. And treatment for breast cancer usually involves one or all of the following modalities to include uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and anti-hormone therapy. With regards to surgery, there are different surgical options. A lumpectomy, which means you take the cancer out with a normal rim of tissue around the cancer. Uh, there is a simple mastectomy taking all the breast tissue, and the so-called modified radical mastectomy means you address the breast tissue and the axilla at the same time. In the old days, all women with breast cancer would have all the lymph nodes in the armpit removed. Well, what they found was that from a very, only a very small percentage of these women actually had cancerous cells within those lymph nodes, around 12% such that a lot of women were having the lymph nodes removed from the axilla unnecessarily. And that was not without complication. If your grandmother, for example, had breast cancer, you probably noticed that, you know, a lot of times there would be these large upper extremities suggesting the fluid or what we call lymphedema. <clears throat> Today we have what's called a sentinel node. Uh, so the sentinel is the first of its kind, as the name suggests. This is the first node to which the breast cancer will go. So that we routinely remove the sentinel node uh, in women with early stage breast cancers, and that node gets tested, and should that node have cancer in it, in the right subpopulation of women, it, it may warrant uh, removal of additional nodes uh, in, in the axilla. Radiation obviously will depend on the kind of, surg I mean, the kind of uh, surgery that you have. If you have, uh, you know, if you have only had a portion of the breast removed, uh, uh, the vast majority of those women will need to have radiation therapy done. Radiation and surgery intends to address local control, while chemotherapy, uh, if appropriate, will address, uh, it will decrease the risk of systemic spread and address pre-existing systemic disease. So that, like we said before, uh, these are the surgical options, uh, basically breast conservation therapy versus uh, mastectomy. And these, most of this is usually appropriate for early stage breast cancer, stage one and stage two breast cancer. Uh, we had talked about sentinel lymph node versus axillary lymph node. So sentinel lymph node is usually routinely performed for these cancers. And uh, there are indications to proceed with axillary lymph node dissection if appropriate. And for those women who are undergoing breast conservation uh, therapy, radiation is a part of that. There are certain contraindications to breast conservation therapy. Uh, I think in my hands, for example, most women, 75% uh, of the breast uh, cancers that I do, those women are treated with breast conservation therapy. However, there are some indications, contraindications for breast conservation therapy. Pregnancy would be one because you can't radiate the pregnant female. Prior history of radiation to the breast or chest wall would be another because they usually, if the, you have irradiated the area, the, the breast tissue would have received the maximum dose of radiation it can receive. If you have disease in more than one location in the breast, that usually requires a mastectomy because uh, in lieu of doing a you know, lumpectomy here and lumpectomy there. If you have if done a lumpectomy uh, and you, your margins uh, continue to be positive, uh, you may have to uh, end up doing a mastectomy depending on the size of the patient's breast. 
Another factor is the breast size to tumor size. If you have a five centimeter breast and you have a four centimeter tumor, then regardless of what you call it, this is going to be removal of all or in the entire breast tissue, so that would be a mastectomy. There are certain diseases such as connective tissue disorders that uh, that where you women don't do well with with the radiation and there are contraindications for radiation and if you can't radiate then you can't uh, do breast conservation therapy and the location of the tumor as well can have an impact on the decision to do breast conservation therapy because if that tumor is right under the nipple it is very very difficult to obtain a cosmetically pleasing effect by doing a lumpectomy which may involve taking that nipple this is to give you some idea of what a mastectomy is, here we have this kind of football shaped incision around the breast and we're raising the flap. So you get into this area between the breast tissue and the uh, skin, preserving the blood supply to the skin and taking all of the breast tissue. And you do that above and below and, and remove uh, all of the breast tissue. Now this is a, a kind of a traditional mastectomy scar, but uh, a lot of the breast operations we do today uh, for cancer cure, we do preserve uh, all of the skin in the vast majority of the cases and the nipple in a significant portion of those cases. So the modified radical mastectomy, removal of all the breast tissue uh, along with ad ad axillary lymph node dissection or the simple mastectomy removing of all the breast tissue, usually uh, we usually offer uh, reconstruction, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, at some point. Uh, the axillary lymph node dissection, which is, you, you can consider a separate operation because this is, the indications for this, uh, you know, is going to be there whether or not you need to do breast conservation therapy or mastectomy. So this is kind of a separate entity. We do a, a sentinel node, for example, where we do mastectomy or uh, or lumpectomy, except when we do a mastectomy, it, it's all one incision. Uh, and you know the axilla is kind of broken into in, into stations or you know or levels, and so we say we take level one and level two. I won't get into uh, what that means. While there is no strict criteria for how much is enough for regards to an axillary dissection, uh, it, it is universally accepted that uh, you need to get more than ten nodes to have uh, claimed that you have adequately sampled uh, the nodes in the axilla. One of the things that, that we, that, that one of the myths out there, you know, we get a lot of women coming in and they have breast cancer. Oh, I need to have, have it all taken off and all my breasts taken off. And, and they think that, that, you know, more means better, that if you have breast cancer, you have a mastectomy, you need to have it all taken off. However, that has been proven, it has been proven by at least seven different large trials that there is no difference between a mastectomy and a and, 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 and breast conservation therapy plus radiation. This is a very old study uh, that goes way back that, that, that proves that. So what I like to tell women is that it seems plausible that taking your and all of your breasts means that you're going to live longer, but actually the, the, the data does not show that. So we do not offer these two as one being better than the other, but as oncologically equivalent procedures. And of course, each operation is tailored to each patient. Like I said before, there may be indications, for example, to do mastectomy. The, there is a slightly higher risk of recurrence with breast conservation therapy, but obviously you can always go back and do mastectomy, and, and that is why the, the overall survival, if you look at a woman who are alive 15 years after breast conservation therapy versus uh, uh, mastectomy, yeah, they are the same. Uh, but some of the women who have had breast conservation therapy may have required additional procedures. Uh, you know, breast conservation therapy traditionally uh, was thought to offer better cosmesis, uh, but of course a lot of that is changing because with the availability of plastic surgery today, uh, women are getting excellent uh, cosmetic outcome with uh, mastectomy, particularly when you consider the availability of immediate breast reconstruction. We've talked about the sentinel lymph node. This is really the first node to which the cancer drain. And, then, and, and so that uh, when you combine uh, a dye material with a radio-labeled material, which is a radioactive material as stated here, you have greater than a 95% de detection rate. So 
with a high degree of certainty, that first node or central node that to which the uh, breast drains uh, really uh, tells us all the information we need to know about the axilla, and the, and if the situation is right, will instruct us as to whether the uh, axilla needs to be cleared with regards to taking additional lymph nodes. This is this is some general statements here, and I will say that the second statement is probably requires some amount of explanation. Certainly, if a woman with an early stage one and stage two breast cancer, and for some reason you can't identify the central node, uh, there may be an indication to go ahead and do a, a, a axillary lymph node dissection. Traditionally, it was thought that if you have a positive central node, you just automatically go on to a axillary lymph node dissection. But there have been certain trials that have challenged that recently. The American College of Surgeons and Oncology Group Z11 trials certainly challenged that idea. And it tells us that not all women who have had a positive axillary node needs to have axillary lymph node dissection. So those are specific circumstances that you need to discuss with your surgeon and with your medical oncologist in regards to whether or not you'd need to have your axilla clear, even if you have had a central node a dissection. The, we talked about the surgery, we talked a little bit about radiation, um, and uh, let's talk about some of the medical treatments. So certainly anti hormone therapy, and the one that you'll be more familiar with is, is tamoxifen, and this is certainly uh, dependent on whether the tumor has these hormones receptors on its surface. So that also uh, can be a part of your treatment. Uh, there are other uh, uh, such drugs called, such as, uh, as Arimidex, uh, and again, these are for tumors that, that express the estrogen and progesterone hormone receptors. In, for invasive cancer, uh, a, a lot of these individuals uh, will receive uh, a chemotherapy. Uh, there are traditionally a lot of patients with invasive cancer greater than a centimeter, for example, receive chemotherapy. That is also changing. We now have uh, other modalities of, of, of stratifying individuals' risk and to see who will and who won't need chemotherapy, such as the Oncotype DX testing, something that you should talk to your medical oncologist about. So, so really, uh, when you meet uh, with your breast team initially, and I strongly encourage that people uh, get their breast cancer care in those manners when you have the opportunity, for example, to meet with a surgeon, a radiation oncologist, and a medical oncologist at once, you know, up front, before you have any treatment offered, so that it gives you the opportunity for that team to sit down, look at your images, and discuss your case, and determine what is the best treatment modality. Because there are cases, for example, where uh, chemotherapy is the first way to get treated. Um, uh, and so that and that depends on a lot of facts. So uh, when you sit down with your team, uh, these are some of the uh, discussions to have uh, to have with your team. Uh, staging of breast cancer, um, the vast majority of breast cancers that we see, fortunately, are stage one breast cancer. We won't get into how we stage, but uh, it is it, it, you know, the reason why I have this slide is so that you can see the importance of screening, the importance of, of early detection, because your five-year survival, if you, have, uh, uh, if you have a stage one breast cancer, is in excess of 90%. And uh, your st stage four breast cancer is around 15%. So that becomes very, very important um, that you continue to screen and, and see those kind of cancers. Radiation. The, the, the traditional uh, radiation uh, that we that you get is is uh, what we call external beam radiation. That's usually about uh, somewhere in the order of uh, of six weeks of uh, of radiation to the breast. But some newer treatment modalities with regards to radiation are also coming into place. Uh, you know, we know that the vast majority of breast cancers, for example, will recur within a certain distance of where your primary cancer was if you have had breast conservation therapy or lumpectomy. So, so we can accelerate the radiation uh, by radiating the site only, and here is a balloon-based accelerated radiation system called the mammocyte catheter. And there are other catheters out there. I'm not promoting any particular catheter. This is the example that I have. 
uh, and you can insert this into your cavity and radiate your cavity. And there are various kinds of, there's at least three uh, catheters that are in the market now, and they all have, uh, you know, they're all, they're all some, there are some pluses and minuses to all of them. Um, but needless to say, this is something that you can use to radiate the, the cancer bed. Uh, rather than whole breast radiation and, and with good success. And accelerated partial breast radiation with, uh, with catheters is, is FDA approved uh, for the treatment of breast cancer. The one kind of area in, in breast cancer that, that is really undergoing a lot of evolution, a lot of change, is how do you manage the axilla. Um, and, you know, that's, that's changing based on, on, on several studies. Uh, then there is the issue of the increase in incidence of mastectomy. You know, I said before that there's no difference from an oncologic standpoint between mastectomy and lumpectomy. However, mastectomy is is at its highest uh, in, in in many many years. And and then there's the issue of women who have had uh, breast cancer that has to get re-excised, that has to get additional tissue taken out because you didn't get it. So let's talk about a few of those things, and I won't get into these trials. I just put them up for, for name recognition. But there are several trials that, that are really going to change the way we, we view breast cancer and the way we treat breast cancer. The uh, American College of Surgeons and Oncology Group Z11 trial is the one that really instructs us in regards to telling us that a lot of women that have one or two positive sentinel nodes, if they meet certain criteria, do not need to have all the lymph nodes removed. So it's not just a reflex response if you have a positive sentinel node to have a lymph node, lymph node removed. And the nine with the Amaros, with, with the uh, Z11 trial is another trial called the Amaros trial, where they looked at women with positive nodes in the axilla and they treated some people with surgery or with radiation. And again, those outcomes were, com were comparable. So I think the days of, of you know, the aggressive axillary dissection and a lot of people getting axillary dissection is, is uh, those days are, are coming to an end. Then there were trials that looked at women who had chemotherapy up front. Remember I said that there's a group of women who had chemotherapy up front. Well, the, the Centina trial and the American College of Oncology Group Z, Z1071 trial, those trials kind of said, well, if you had the chemotherapy up front, is it still safe to do the sentinel and lymph node biopsy? Has the staging for the axilla? And these trials certainly showed that it was. There are certain trials that are still ongoing that will better answer that question and uh, of, of note that the, the, B, the NSABP B51 trial and the Alliance 11202 trials uh, are a part of that. I will mention briefly uh, a new technology that we have here at Mercy called the uh, margin probe. You know, one of the uh, more vexing issues with uh, breast cancer, as I stated before, is when treated with breast conservation therapy, nationally, an average of about 25% of these women will need to go back to the operating room to have additional tissue taken, the so-called positive margin patients. The, uh, there have been several studies around the, uh, a piece of technology called the margin probe uh, that looked at uh, all of the issues surrounding positive margins, uh, the cost to the patient, the cost to the hospital, the psychological impact on the patient, etc. And uh, this technology has to do with infrared spectroscopy and in the operating room, you can put the probe against the uh, tissue. So this probe never touches the patient. Uh, here you can see the probe uh, that is being used, being used to interrogate the margins of the tissue. If that margin shows up with all green, that margin is probably okay. If it shows up with some red, it says that there's probably some tumor, cancer cells, or precancer cells, DCIS, uh, within two millimeters of that probe. So that probe is able to instruct us with regards to re-excision of margins. This is the, the, the readout that you're looking at here uh, comes on this screen. So it's, it's, it's a tiny piece of instrument in the operating room that can fit into any operating room. It's not a real cumbersome piece of instrument. And I'm not going to get too much into the science of it. This is what the tip of the probe looks like. There's a, a suction device. Again, this is uh, some of the science behind it with regards to the, to the, to the feedback. And there are several studies. There was a uh, pre-market. Uh, there are two pre-market studies: the mass trial and the pivotal trial. There was a post-market German trial. But the one thing in all of those trials, what it showed is that you could at least decrease your reexcision rate by 50%. Uh, so uh, significant. 
And, and so on and on goes these trials uh, that really there's a lot of data and a lot of science. And since the time when they rolled this out, there, were, there have been several other studies that have been published in peer-reviewed journals uh, showing the efficacy of the, uh, of the margin probe. It has been proven to reduce positive margins uh, to lower re-excision rates, and every time you have to re-excise someone, it, it may impact the cosmetic outcome because you're taking more tissue. You're also draining that fluid which fills that cavity, which is a part of what we use to, what is necessary to reform the shape of the breast. So the, 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 the impact on the patient, on the institution, on the patient, physical and psychological, these are all significant impact. And so we have this probe here at Mercy, um, uh, almost all of our patients are candidates for uh, for use of the uh, the margin probe. Prior to uh, for an, as an example, prior to to uh, to my use in the margin probe, remember I told you that the national reaccession rate for cancers was about uh, twenty five percent. For for pre cancer, it's actually a little lower, goes up to a little higher rather, goes up to about thirty percent, seven percent. And this is one of my earlier slides once I started using the margin probe. This was, we had done about, uh, uh, about, um, uh, uh, we, we had done about, uh, only about six to seven cases at that time. Um, and, you know, my personal re-excision rate uh, was 14.93% uh, uh, before I started using the margin probe. So this looks like, uh, the, the, so these are for the, the, the pre, if you look at my, the pre-margin probe data here with six, seven cases. After I started using the margin probe, my re-excision rate went down to 0%. So I, I was able to achieve better than a 50% reduction. And we have done over 80 cases now with the margin probe and the numbers remain pretty similar. So uh, when I updated this information after six or seven cases, I had done one re-excision, and so my, my re-excision rate is around 0.015%. And I think uh, after about 80 cases, that one re-excision is the only re-excision I've done. I'm not a reconstructive surgeon, so I won't get too much into reconstruction, but certainly after mastectomy, there are there is reconstruction. This is traditionally is one of the major concerns of women. Oh, how am I going to look? Well, there is re reconstruction. About 70% of women who uh, get breast cancer surgery get reconstructed with an implant, but there are other options, such as your, using your own tissue. Uh, and the, there are different kinds of tissue flaps. There are uh, opportunities to spare all of your skin and spare your nipple. So that the reconstruction has really taken another step, and, and it's certainly one of the positives with regards to uh, breast cancer surgery and reconstruction after breast cancer surgery. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Reed, for that very important, very interesting information. Uh, if any of our listeners have additional questions about breast cancer treatment or surgery, you can send your questions to the link on your screen, mercycare.org forward slash contact us. You can also check the lower website, um, or the lower link um, to our website for information about future webinars or to listen to past webinars. Well, once again, I want to thank you, Dr. Reed, and thank you, our listeners, for joining us today.